So in exactly the same way that you use a pencil and a lumber crayon and a square to put marks on top plates and bottom plates to communicate information to, fr for, to the framers, to the guys putting the studs in your wall system, you've got to be able to put information on the ground to communicate to the excavation contractor, to the underground utility guy, to the people that are going to come in here and have to adjust the dirt on this site to make it comply with the mountain of information that a civil engineer has put on here for dealing with slopes and drains and cuts and fills. So one of the big differences between communicating to a framer where the window goes and communicating to an excavator where the driveway goes or where the transformer goes or where the electrical line goes is the cost to fix the mistake. It's a huge deal. If the information on a set of civil drawings is not communicated accurately, block walls and property lines, those kinds of things are deal breakers. They will bankrupt you because of the expense involved in getting it wrong. So when you put your marks on the ground, you have to have real confidence, first, that they're right, and second, that the mark is going to be still there when the work is done and legible, perfectly communicated with the person that's doing the work. Here are the tools that are used to put this information on the ground. Marking paint, white. The owner, the person who's giving the general instructions, the general work locations, should use white because it's not confused with the marks that are used to identify underground utilities. It doesn't like to mark on dust. So at least in the desert, and in general, this is to be put in place just before the work happens. Here's a white flag. That serves the same purpose, but it doesn't rub out with the toe of your boot. This is called, variously, a whisker or a blue top. You drive that into the ground to where the top of the nail is at grade, and in a grader, a machine can work down and know that he's getting close when he sees those pink whiskers sticking up. So this locates horizontal distance and vertical distance for the operator. The head of that nail will be set in a very specific location so that someone, even someone setting a curb form, can find out what the location at that spot is and compare it to the called out location on the plan. Behind most of these is a stake and this is where the details are communicated. If there's a number and it's circled, that's an offset. That means that this whisker, that pin, is five feet away from FW, that means face of wall. So the block wall that goes in here, the near face of that block wall facing in that direction because that is the direction that the instru instructions are facing, is about five feet away. There's a variety of acronyms that'll show up here. It may be CL, that's center line. It may be um, PC, which means point of curve or point of curvature. There are various acronyms and they're all fairly intuitive. And if you have a question, call your surveyor. But since you know what you're building and you know what the plans look like and you know what the stake is, you'll know what that acronym stands for, just comparing it to the plans. Moving on down in this case, that F stands for fill. A fill of fill plus, in other words, you're coming up zero feet and 72 hundredths to the finished grade, FG. This stake, which got torn out on the other side of the job, was a five foot offset to face of wall and at the whisker, at the top of the nail, there's a cut of zero feet and 48 hundredths to the finished grade. So the difference between a cut and a fill is a cut means that you're removing existing grade down below that elevation. A fill means you are adding dirt to this spot until it is 72 hundredths above that elevation. 72 hundredths. Hmm. I begin to sound like a metric purveyor, don't I? Here's the confusion around this system of measurement. This is in feet and hundredths of a foot. An eighth of an inch is almost exactly one one hundredth of a foot. So it's fairly easy to do the conversion on. In fact, it's really easy to do the conversion on that. 72 hundredths is 72 eighths. 72 eighths is nine inches. So the finished grade here is going to be nine inches above the top of that nail, right up in here. So what these stakes, these offset stakes are marking is a block wall. And where the block wall turns, where the corner occurs, and where it occurs going down a property line. The reason they're offset is because when the work happens of constructing the wall, 
there has to be room for the monument to remain so the work can be double checked. Now you can just figure on some number of, the, of these stakes being wiped out. It's going to happen. It's part of it's part of the, the cost of the surveyor is having him come back occasionally. You caution your contractors to be easy on my stakes. It costs money to replace them, but you've got to expect there's going to be a little rework. So however important these stakes are and the whiskers, these are the gospel. Okay, that's a monument. That's a surveyed, established corner of the property. And all of these other um, survey stakes are for convenience and for conveying the information on these plans. So one of the things you do for your own peace of mind and for the uh, happy outcome of the project is to let your contractor know, look, whatever these things are telling you, we've got to make sure that we are inside of the property line. Because you talk about an expensive mistake, try building a block wall on the neighbor's side of the line and see how much it costs you. So I'm in a back corner of the property right now and there's no rebar monument down here because it's tangled up with two existing fences, which it should be because it's the corner of two property lines. So the, the hub that's been located by the surveyor is located right there on that wood fence with a little nail and a little brass washer, and it's accurate. Sometimes the surveyor has to improvise on how he provides a monument that you can take to the bank for locating your property line and the structures on your property. Whatever he's got to use, his insurance company is standing behind the location of that hub. Now that's a nice thing because there are some terribly tragic stories about construction geeks like me building things that are a little bit on the neighbor's property and the overwhelming expenses that are associated with tearing it out, moving it over some number of inches or feet and building it again. This project is bounded on three sides by neighbors, lots of neighbors. I don't know how many people, individuals, property um, abut Nate's property. So his choice, and it's a wise choice, is to put his block wall entirely on his property. These existing fences are going to stay. He doesn't want to get tangled up with dogs and kids and security issues. He wants to leave the neighbor security exactly the way they have been content with it all this time and then establish his security on his property. It gives up a few inches of real estate, but it gives him all the control in the world on his fence, where it's at, how it's installed, and who's responsible for it in the future if it gets damaged from the other side. This is going to be a mini-series, small. I don't know how many videos will be included in this, but it's not going to be a huge number. All the costs, as with our other projects, will be included on our Patreon page if that's of interest to you. Thanks for watching. Hang out with us a little bit in Arizona. It's going to get hot over the next two or three months, but that's all right. We'll survive it. <laughs>